Okay. So uh, without Islichi has kind of created a, a talk in the seminar. His title is Stratifications in Algebra and Topology. Take it away, Aaron. Thanks a lot, David. Um, I just noticed that uh, my Wi-Fi connection might not be great. Um, I'll switch if necessary, um, but please let me know if you can't hear me well. Is it okay right now? Great, thanks, Mark. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about stratifications in algebra and topology. Um, so this is based on joint work with uh, David Ayala and Nick Rosenblum. Um, we were hoping to finish uh, the second version of the paper that's got a lot of uh, really fun additions. Uh, we didn't quite do that, but we put version 1.9. Um, uh, well, it's posted there. Um, anyways, uh, so I will start by uh, recalling some uh, facts about Recolmont. Um, I'll explain what that is. And I'll talk about how that generalizes to stratifications. Uh, then I'll talk about the uh, monoidal version, symmetric monoidal version, and so on. Uh, and uh, then I'll, I'll possibly uh, speak briefly about how this applies to compute equivariant cohomology. OK, uh, so as David said, please, uh, please pipe up if you have questions. Um, OK, so just uh, some standing conventions here. Uh, I'll say category, uh, and I mean presentable stable infinity category. So uh, if you like, uh, you can think of pre-triangulated DG categories um, with infinite sums. So we're in the large context here. Uh, and scheme just means nice scheme. Uh, so please don't ask too many questions about uh, separation axioms and so on. OK. Um, so Reckelmann. So the prototype Reckelmont that uh, we'll, we'll come back to this soon enough uh, is that if I have a Z module, I want to be able to reconstruct it from uh, data that's in some sense simpler, local. Uh, so specifically, uh, you can take its P completions um, and you can also take its rationalization. And the assertion is that you can, uh, you can reconstruct the Z module uh, between uh, having those as well as an additional piece of data, namely some gluing data, uh, and that manifests itself in this map right here. Um, so this is where we're headed. Um, this uh, might be familiar or might not. Uh, that's, the, that's fine. Um, so I'll start by just uh, simultaneously explaining uh, how Reclamants work in both algebra and in topology. Um, so the source of them is, uh, in any case, uh, closed open decomposition. This is the major source of them. Uh, so uh, on the scheme side, we have a closed open decomposition. So Z is always closed, U is always open, I and J are their inclusions. Um, and here on the scheme side, we're going to also want to contemplate the formal completion. So you can think of this as like a tubular neighborhood. Um, I'll give an example in just a moment, um, but I want to get the general picture out there first. Uh, meanwhile, on the topology side, if you have a topological space, you likewise can have a closed open decomposition. Notice that I put the closed on the left here and the open on the right here. There's a sort of duality um, going on uh, that will carry through uh, throughout the story. So those are closed open decompositions and they result in Reckelmann. So what is that? Well, it's some massive diagram of categories and adjoint functors. Um, so I'll just talk through it uh, one side at a time. So on the Q code side, um, well, you can restrict to the open uh, and by definition, if you restrict to zero, that means that you are supported on the closed. So this is the, the kernel of this upper functor is the full subcategory um, of those quasi current sheaves that are supported on, on Z. Um, and uh, so that inclusion has a right adjoint. And uh, there's this really interesting equivalence uh, between these sheaves supported on Z and quasi current sheaves on the formal completion. Um, and so this triangle right here commutes. Uh, and, and then we've got this adjunction of pullback and push forward right there. Uh, meanwhile, on the topology side, um, we've got sheaves on the main topological space, 
Uh, and then we've got sheaves on the open and sheaves on the closed, and these have various uh, push-pull functors uh, that relate them. Um, it works at that level of, of generality, but I'll actually, uh, just for thinking about these things, I'll restrict to the, the situation where, uh, well, the, the restriction to the open and to the closed are respectively locally constant, uh, are both locally constant, which, which means uh, that we're just contemplating constructible sheaves uh, with respect to this closed open decomposition. Um, okay, so those are those are the the general situations, and now here are some examples to keep in mind. Um, so on the scheme side, here's a nice example of a, a closed open decomposition. We've got the affine line. I drew it right here, uh, and it's got the origin right here, uh, and the formal completion, which we'll also be thinking about. Well, that's just called a one hat. In general, it's called x uh, hat sub z. Um, but you can see I sort of drew it like a point with this just fuzz around it. Uh, meanwhile, the open complement is the punctured affine line. Uh, on the topology side, um, if I start with the topological space K, I can take the cone on it. Um, and well, the closed open decomposition uh, that I'll consider is where the closed is just the cone point. Um, so if I take the circle, then I'm talking about, well, the closed two disk, uh, and the open complement is the closed two disk with its origin removed. Um, on the other hand, if I take the two torus, I, I just wanted to draw another example. Um, so here it is. It's the cone on the two torus, but keep in mind that a, a little neighborhood around this cone point is interesting. Um, we'll see that manifest itself in a moment. Uh, and then here's here's the complement. That's uh, where we've just removed that cone point. So those are examples of closed open decompositions, and they give the following uh, recommands. So um, on the algebra side, well, quasi-current sheaves on an affine scheme is just modules. So these are k join x modules, or said differently, uh, k vector spaces equipped with an endomorphism. Uh, localization to the open, well, uh, when you remove the origin, that amounts to inverting X. Um, and so to go from here to here, you are tensoring up uh, with X plus and minus. Um, you can just notate, think of that as inverting the endomorphism, um, forcing it to be an automorphism universally. Um, and that also tells you how do you localize into this uh, torsion subcategory. Uh, the subcategory of, of the um, k join x modules that are uh, torsion with respect to uh, the action of that ideal. Namely, uh, well, there's a unit map for this adjunction, and you just take its fiber, um, and that pushes you down into here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the quasi current sheaves on the um, formal completion, well, the formal affine line, uh, it's quasi-current sheaves are modules over um, the power series ring now, and they're required to be complete with respect to that ideal. Um, on the other side, we've got the, the category in the middle. Well, let me start over here. So we've got locally constant sheaves on the point, um, which is just V. I'm writing V to think of vector spaces. Uh, that's just whatever target we've got. Um, so locally constant sheaves on a point uh, is just V. Uh, locally constant sheaves on this, uh, the thing where you remove the cone point, well, uh, because I said locally constant, this, this product is homotopy equivalent to that, and so locally constant sheaves agree. Uh, in turn, this is just, uh, well, that's some topological space, and I can take its fundamental infinity groupoid. Um, and this is pretty much the point of fundamental infinity groupoids is that um, maps out of it are the same as locally constant sheaves on the original topological space. Uh, so what's more interesting is, is the object in the middle. So constructible sheaves um, on this cone, uh, it's been a theme in this uh, semester, which has been a lot of fun to explore, um, that constructible sheaves um, correspond to functors out of the exit path infinity category. Um, so this is a generalization of the fundamental infinity groupoid. It's uh, 
uh, objects are the points of the topological space and its morphisms are paths, um, but they are uh, only allowed to exit from one stratum to another stratum. Um, in this case, they can only uh, exit from the point uh, into the uh, complement, and they can never come back to the point. And um, what, what that implies is that the exit path infinity category of this cone that I drew uh, is really just, well, the fundamental infinity groupoid of, of the space, and then you take less cone, so that you formally adjoin an initial object. And functors into our target V, those are the constructible sheaves on this cone. Okay, uh, so those are the examples, and now let me put them in a common context. Uh, this is the abstract definition of a Reclamont. So a Reclamont, like I said, is just some massive diagram of categories, uh, three categories, six functors. Um, it's a diagram like this, uh, and the only condition is that all three sequences are exact. So if I go here and here, kernel equals image. Uh, likewise here and then here, and here and then here. Um, so I've just got a little bit of notation. And there's an asymmetry here. So these are inclusions of, of Z into X. Let me also mention, I'm using the QCO uh, notation uh, in that I've got the Z, which always means closed on the left-hand side. Um, so Z has two different inclusions into X. Here you see it's one of them is the, abstractly there's just this one category, but you can either manifest it as the torsion uh, sheaves or the complete sheaves. Um, so I'll call these IL and IR, left and right adjoint inclusions. Uh, likewise, I've got PL and PR, the projections. Um, so then the terminology for the, the, the remaining two functors, well, this is basically, this is restricted Yoneda along IL, so I'll just call it Y. Um, and then new stands for the null objects with respect to the restricted unit embedding. Remember, this sequence is exact, so uh, you are in the image of new if and only if you're in the kernel of Y. So that is a, a reclamant, and uh, these are examples, and in fact, the general um, situations I wrote, like up here, those are, those are also examples. So the reason that Reclamont are, Reclamonts are good um, is they allow you to, to reconstruct things. So first, let me describe this. I'll call it the microcosm reconstruction theorem. It's like an object level reconstruction. So if I've got this Reclamont and I've got an object, I'll write F because you should think of it like a sheath. Um, let me just write F0 for the projection down into Z and F1 for the projection down into U. Then uh, we can reconstruct the, the object F as a pullback. So F0, um, I include it back into X by IR. So I, I wrote these as red um, because they're going to play a distinguished role for us. So I can apply IR to this uh, F0 and I can apply new to F1. Um, and then F, I can glue from the data of those two things uh, along with some more. Uh, so, first of all, this map down here, this is just the unit uh, for a certain adjunction. So there's nothing to remember. It just comes from the data of the Reclamont. Um, and, and right here in red, you see uh, PLIR, uh, IR followed by PL. So we've got this object in Z. We push it all the way forward to U, um, and we include back in. Uh, by contrast, this map right here is, uh, is determined by F specifically. So if we want to be able to reconstruct F, we're going to need to keep track of this gluing map. Um, but once we do, then we get this microcosm reconstruction theorem. Uh, any object is a pullback. Um, so it turns out that that pullback square is unique in the following strong sense. Uh, well, you know, this just came from applying units of adjunctions. Uh, so it, uh, given F, there's exactly one way to get such a square, uh, and that's articulated by this macrocosm, in other words, category level reconstruction theorem. So the, the theorem is that uh, the whole category X is equivalent, well, if I take F, so first of all, I, IR and nu are, are fully faithful, so 
if I want to remember these two objects, I can just remember their values inside of their respective subcategories. So let's just remember F0, let's remember F1, and then also, again, new is fully faithful, so to remember this gluing map, it suffices to just remember the map inside of the category U, the subcategory. Um, and so that's what I want to do. I want to remember that object, that object, and then the morphism between them. Here's this PLIR again, the, the red composite. Um, and this construction uh, up is, is just a general categorical construction applied to a functor uh, from Z to U. And it has a name, it's called the right lax limit. So ordinarily, a, limit, uh, ordinarily a, a, a homotopy limit, how do you construct that? Well, you take an object, uh, a point in each value, uh, and then you have to choose equivalences uh, that witness them as being compatible. Well, this is more lax than that. Namely, rather than equivalences, I just have morphisms that witness them as laxly compatible, right laxly compatible. So in this case, I, I apply the functor and then I've got a morphism to the value of the object. That's what makes it right lax. Less lax would be the other direction if I had a map out of uh, the value of the functor. Okay, so again, I've just defined Reclamont abstractly. And at that level of generality, it has microcosm reconstruction for objects, and in fact, macrocosm reconstruction for the whole category. Okay, so let's apply this in our examples. Um, so here are the Reclamont. Again, uh, all I've done is just highlight these red composites. So what does this one do? Well, you just forget that your K double join X module what was such, you just remember as K, K join X. Uh, and then you invert X. So I, I notated that here. Forget the completeness, then invert X. Meanwhile, over here, uh, we've got this J lower star followed by I upper star. Uh, in other words, the, the star stock uh, at the cone point. Um, and so this is like a push-pull operation with respect to the star uh, functors. So then here's the microcosm reconstruction is, um, well, if I've got a, a, a K join X module, I can localize it uh, to the formal completion. So I, I drew this blue to indicate where I've localized it to. Uh, I can localize it to the open complement. And then I've got this unit map. So that just says push forward from here to uh, the whole affine line and then restrict it. So heuristically, you can think of this as like being recorded by a punctured formal neighborhood. Um, that notion is uh, notoriously difficult to make real sense of in algebraic geometry, um, so I put it in quotes. Um, but this red right here indicates this composite operation, um, and somehow this is recording the well, this along with this gluing map that arises from the data of M uh, is, is what's needed to reconstruct M. On this side, um, I've got the restriction to the open, so that's a local system on K. Um, I've got the value at the cone point, uh, and then I've got this gluing map, and let me point out that if I do star push forward and then take the stock, that is uh, nothing other than total cohomology, aka derived global sections. Um, once again, we have this gluing map, and uh, the geometry that's, um, that, that's uh, incorporated into this is it's really something about what's called the link between the strata. Um, that, that that is what's responsible for, for the fact that this is the construction that we're seeing. So in the example I chose, the links are very simple, um, which is why uh, we're, we're simply seeing that. So uh, now the macrocosm reconstruction theorem, uh, I just put, put these together. Um, so a Kedrain X module is recorded by its completion uh, at that ideal and uh, its value on the open complement and then this gluing map. There's this red once again. Uh, and likewise, a constructible sheaf is recorded by uh, a local system on K. Um, and then you take its derived global sections and then you choose a, a stock at the origin and you map into it. So this uh, should be familiar. If you're familiar with left cones, uh, how do you map out of them? 
well, you choose an object, uh, you choose a map out of this, and then you choose a map uh, from an arbitrary object into uh, its homotopy invariance. Okay, uh, one side remark here is uh, there's a sort of abstract uh, form of Verdier duality, uh, which allows you to reconstruct by IL followed by PR uh, instead of IR followed by PL. So for example, in, in the constructible context, you're going to be getting the shriek uh, push-pull uh, instead of star push-pull. Um, so those are uh, formally dual, and that duality actually just happens at the level of Reclamant, and this remark applies later as well when I talk about stratifications, um, which I'll do now, unless there are any questions. Well, please, please interrupt if you do have a question. Um, so I'll first just describe stratifications uh, over the post at bracket two. Um, there's an additional subtlety that I'll describe afterwards, um, but first let's just start here. So a stratification, uh, and, and now I'll specialize to the algebra side. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to the topology side later. Um, so a stratification of, of a scheme over brackets two, it's just a functor into its post set of closed subsets, uh, with such that Z2 is, is the whole thing. So it's Z0, Z1, Z2, each of them is closed. So here's an example to keep in mind is um, the affine plane being stratified by the x-axis, which is in turn stratified by the origin. So here is the picture. Um, and that's a stratification. Um, and it has strata, which are, uh, so those are closed, and it has strata, which are locally closed. So how do you get those? You just take the difference. Uh, so the top stratum is Z2 minus Z1. Here you see Z2 minus Z1. The first stratum is Z1 minus Z0, and then the bottom stratum is just Z0 minus nothing, so Z0. Um, and this is locally closed. Uh, just because it's a complement of a closed and a closed. So uh, I'll use that to motivate the definition of, of a stratification of a category. Uh, but first, I have to tell you what is a closed uh, thing. So once again, this is QCO terminology. So a closed subcategory of my category X, it's a full presentable stable subcategory such that the inclusion admits a right adjoint, which itself admits the right adjoint. Uh, so it's a lot, but we did just see those things. Uh, and an example is if I have a closed subset of X, then the sheaves that are support, the consequent sheaves supported on that form a closed subcategory. That was uh, what we just saw uh, on the left side. So given that, I can define a stratification of the category over brackets two. It's likewise just a functor. I'll write curly Z bullet. Uh, into the post set of, of closed subcategories. And once again, I want to make sure that it like generates the whole thing. So I've got Z2 equals X. And for example, um, for example, uh, if I have a stratification of my scheme X, I can just post compose. Look, this construction is, uh, is a functor of post sets from this post set to that post set. So closed subsets give closed subcategories in a way that respects inclusion. Um, and uh, clearly this generation condition is satisfied, uh, is, is preserved under composing. Um, so now there's a bit more. So over here, I just defined the stratum, but really I want to reconstruct the whole category. So I'm gonna have to tell you how I'm gonna glue it back together. So here's some stuff. Uh, let's look at this together. So the i stratum, now I'm going to be taking not the set theoretic difference, but rather the quotient, the presentable quotient. Um, so for example, uh, if you came from a stratification of a scheme, well, each of these strata is locally closed, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and so you can embed it uh, into an open in which it is closed. And then you can take the formal completion there. And that it, it is uh, going to be QCO of that. It turns out to be independent of this choice of factorization. Um, so the stratum of this uh, stratified category is this quotient. Um, and this comes with a, an adjunction uh, from x down to it. And um, 
this gives us uh, what I'll call a gluing puncture. From the i to the j stratum, you just include and then you project down. So for example, uh, we already saw this, it's you include and then you project down. This inclusion is that inclusion, or this is an instance of that. Uh, when I put those all together, I get a gluing diagram. This is the same sort of deal as with a Reclamont, um, but that was just a stratification over the post brackets one. Um, so I go from X0 to X1, this gluing functor, uh, from X1 to X2, and 0 to 2. Um, however, those don't uh, strictly agree. Rather, there there is a comparison morphism between them, uh, which means that this is not a functor from brackets 2 to cat, but rather a left lax functor. It only left laxly respects composition. So let's just see that in this example. Um, I, so, so we had these pictures of the strata, um, and I had this description of, of the strata. Uh, so QCO of this formal completion, that's the origin, uh, the formal neighborhood in the whole plane. Uh, and then this stratum uh, is just, uh, it, it's just X minus Y. Oh, I wrote X, Y, and Z instead of Z zero. Hopefully it's clear what I mean. Uh, the, the middle term is the uh, formal neighborhood of uh, this complement inside of that thing. So this, this, uh, these operations are you just push to the whole thing and then you restrict. So if I push from here to the whole plane and then I restrict down to here, you can imagine that it's like this picture. Uh, it's this deleted neighborhood and the fuzz is kind of going in every direction except the horizontal one. Contrast that with if you push pull to here and then you push pull down here, well, over here you've sort of lost track of the vertical tangent directions as well. So schematically you could draw that as this picture. Um, and comparing these two, these are, these are not the same and that, um, is at least suggestive of the fact that they don't compose, um, but in fact they do so laxly. Hey, Aaron. Yeah. This is this is Jeremy. Can you help me reconcile? Oh, hey, Jeremy. <laughs> Can you help me reconcile the quotient operation on the left side and the complement operation on the right side? Yeah, we already saw that um, with an ordinary uh, closed open decomposition. Um, and when you take the quotient of QCO supported on Z, uh, the quotient of QCO of X uh, mod the ones that are supported on Z, you get QCO of the open complement. So uh, taking set theoretic differences in schemes um, corresponds to taking quotient categories. Uh, okay, thank you. QCO. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so uh, yeah, so, I, I, so I've described this gluing diagram, it's a, um, left lax diagram, a functor from brackets two to, to categories. So here's the reconstruction theorem, macrocosm reconstruction. Um, I want to take, once again, the right lax limit of this diagram, uh, which I just copied down here, and I call this thing new. So what is that? Well, it's an object in each category, and then a comparison morphism every time I have a functor. And uh, so here's an object, there's an object, there's a comparison morphism to its image. Here, I've got two comparison uh, functors coming in, so I've got this comparison morphism and that one. Uh, but in fact, in this case, there's more compatibility. Namely, I had this morphism, and I can apply that functor to it, and I, I end up right here. Um, and that can be compared with this natural transformation evaluates as a morphism right there along the bottom. Um, and so, in fact, there's something new and surprising that shows up here, which is why I wanted to highlight this example before proceeding to the general case, which is that there, the, there's more data. I have to remember, the, I, I have to name a homotopy that witnesses the commutativity of this, of this square. So whereas this gluing data was like gamma zero one, from the zero to the one, this is like gamma zero one two, it corresponds to the composite from zero to one to two. Um, so it's like higher gluing data. And uh, in a precise sense, the reason this is appearing is because the handednesses disagree. So we're taking a right lax limit of a left lax functor. And if those handednesses agreed, there would not be um, this additional uh, higher dimensional coherence condition. Um, I'll just say I, I find it really 
shocking that um, such an elaborate categorical notion um, just shows up. It's like God given in geometry. Um, I, I guess I'm happy about that, um, but it is, I, I do find it surprising. So that was macrocosm reconstruction and microcosm reconstruction is sort of embedded inside of it. If I have such a thing, I can reconstruct an object of X. There's a bunch of notation, but let me just indicate the shape of things. Uh, namely, given all of this stuff, I can make this punctured cube shaped uh, diagram. So this is this, this arrow is that arrow, and then this square is the back square. Um, roughly speaking, how do you, you take this data and then you apply these various rows, sub, uh, super I, uh, inclusions back into the whole category. And then you can take the limit of that punctured cube and that's an object here and that implements, uh, that's the inverse functor. Okay, so that's micro, macrocosm and microcosm reconstruction in the case of brackets too. Um, so with that in mind, let me uh, now go to the general case uh, of an arbitrary poset. Hey, Aaron. So, uh, yeah. Question. This is uh, Jay. Uh, okay. So these sorts of uh, reconstruction uh, sort of theorems, um, I at least first learned of them in uh, Ecuadorian stable homotopy theory. Uh, I guess I have a historical question. Do you know um, where they first appear in algebraic geometry proper in like setting quasi clear chiefs? Is that in your work or are there antecedents? Oh, certainly not. Oh, oh, sorry, the like stratifications or just reclamant? Um, these sorts of presentations of quasi clear chiefs in terms of these sorts of fracture cubes. I said, well, I mean, the Delta one case, so surely. I mean, these helpful. fracture cubes also are, have been, um, Noticed before, uh, for example, Omar and Toby um, have a thing about fracture cubes in uh, chromatic homotopy theory. Um, and uh, I, I think we were the first to see the fully general context of an arbitrary poset that I'll describe now. Um, but uh, also um, John Greenlee's uh, and, well, yes, there's a long history. Uh, there's, a, there's a brief bit of history recorded in our paper uh, that you should feel free to check out. Um, sure. But this, this, this is not due to us, this picture right here. Um, but let me tell you some stuff that is. Uh, so a stratification of a scheme over an arbitrary poset, it's a functor. So remember, I wanted to make sure I was capturing the whole scheme. So once again, I have this sort of generation condition uh, that the union of all of these stratum closures is the whole thing, is all of X. But now I have a new condition, which was invisible in the brackets two case, namely the stratification condition, which says for any two elements of the poset, when you intersect these closures, stratum closures, that intersection needs to be uh, covered by, by uh, stratum closures that are recorded in the poset as mapping uh, into them. So in this example, the affine plane stratified by the x-axis and the y-axis, those intersect at the origin and you need to include the origin as well as the inclusions. If you didn't have the inclusions, it, it wouldn't work out. Um, so this should be plausible, remembering that we're trying to re-glue. So if things overlap, but you forgot that they overlapped, um, it, you're gonna have a hard time re-gluing properly. So this is the stratification condition. Um, and I think the real, uh, the, the core of everything is generalizing that to the situation of categories. So a stratification of a category, uh, well, it's a functor from the post set into close of categories. Uh, so it's still, once again, this generation condition, uh, and now the stratification condition. So likewise, for any pair of elements, uh, you can include into the whole category and restrict, um, and that is required to factor through uh, the union of those closed subcategories that are witnessed by the post set as mapping into both ZP and ZQ. It's um, pretty closely analogous to this thing, but there's a handedness to all of it. I'll make a brief comment about that later. Um, so two examples, uh, two sources of examples are, if I have a stratified scheme, I can uh, post compose with this functor Q co supported on some closed subset uh, this functor and I, I get a stratification of QCO. 
Um, and here I'll just mention what's the deal with uh, stratified topological spaces. Well, if I have a topological space stratified over a post set, um, actually the way that it works, it's again, this duality is that you take the opposite of the post set uh, and you, it, that, that gets a functor to the category of open, the post set of open subsets um, of X. And in turn, uh, we take sheaves on those or locally constant sheaves or whatever. Um, and again, there's this uh, mismatch open versus closed. It, there was going to be one either way, uh, and I chose for it to be this one. Um, but oh well, I, I think overall it's a good thing that duality exists. I, I'm also happy about that. So uh, here are some slight generalizations of the stories uh, I was just telling for brackets two. So now the peath stratum, I, I take the peath closed subcategory, and then I quotient out by let's see all of the all of the things that are less than p. Um, and similar sort of game, there's this adjunction. You get this gluing diagram, and once again, uh, it is a left lax functor from the post set to the category. So each element is taken to the corresponding stratum that I, I just defined right here, and it's left lax because if I have a composite, then these gluing functors don't compose. And we already saw that um, in, the, uh, in the brackets two case. Um, so, additionally, there's this comparison functor that takes uh, an object of the category to its microcosm gluing diagram. Um, so, again, that's these localizations. Uh, if you're familiar with equivariant homotopy theory, uh, it's for good reason that I'm using phi, uh, capital phi here. Um, so, so uh, it takes an object here to its gluing diagram, which is these localizations, and then some additional gluing data that relates them. Um, and uh, let, uh, suggestively, there is this right adjoint always, uh, which takes a limit over something called the subdivision uh, poset of, of our original poset. So uh, here's just two examples. There's a pretty basic a general definition, but for brackets one, you're getting this uh, co-span. For brackets two, you're getting this punctured cube. And in fact, for brackets n, it's a punctured n uh, plus one cube. So, so for example, if p post set was brackets one, then we're taking this object to, um, could you to this data. Could you screen up, you're, at the, you're really at the very, 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 very bottom of the screen. Oh, there. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. so, so S goes to this data. Um, and then that's included back into the category, and then I take the pullback uh, in the brackets one case. Okay, so this is just a reminder of things we saw. Um, okay, so so again, uh, I stratify my category. I get these strata. They are related by gluing functors. Those gluing functors assemble into a left lax uh, diagram shaped over the post set, left lax diagram of categories. Um, and um, there's a comparison functor from the category to the right lax limit, um, which is an elaboration of the definition that I gave earlier. Uh, so let's do an example. So the example uh, is uh, back to Z modules. So the category curly X is Z modules. And uh, P sub Z, the post set, um, this is uh, uh, the specialization post set of specsy actually, um, it looks like this. So it's just got all of these pr uh, points corresponding to primes, and then it's got this one generic point, and this is the correct direction, uh, it turns out. So, so this is the post set, and this is going to be an instance of a more general phenomenon uh, of a Delic reconstruction. Um, this has this canonical functor to close subcategories. Uh, so the primes each pick out the corresponding torsion abelian groups, uh, Z modules. Um, so two is sent to the closed subcategory of two torsion Z modules. Three is sent to a closed subcategory of three torsion Z modules, et cetera. Uh, and this is the maximal element. Well, if we're going to have the generation condition satisfied, uh, this had better go to the whole category. Indeed, it does. Um, so we can form this, uh, find, we can take the strata and form this gluing diagram among the strata. Let me describe that now. So 
we've got this gluing diagram. It's a left lax functor from this poset to cat. Um, but this poset actually, it only has depth one. So there is no such thing as a lax functor out of it. There's only strict functors. Um, and the gluing diagram looks like this. So again, that's where you take these quotients. Uh, you, the, the, the value of the gluing diagram is this corresponding stratum, which is what you get where you take that closed subcategory, you quotient by all of the things less than it, uh, and then you do this funny business with the IR inclusion. So here, there's nothing less than it, um, so I don't change the category, but I do change the inclusion. So the two torsion uh, becomes now, I'll think of it as the two complete uh, modules over the two addicts, uh, three complete over three addicts, et cetera. And here, when I take the quotient by all of the stuff less than it, well, if I look at Z modules that have no two torsion, no three torsion, no five torsion, et cetera, that's exactly a fashion vector space. Um, so I get Q mod up here. And the, these gluing functors, well, again, I include and then I restrict. So just forget that I'm too complete and then rationalize. So I'll just write rationalization for that functor. Um, so that is this macrocosm gluing diagram in this special case um, of Z modules. Uh, so now we have this functor that takes uh, that goes from the category to this limit and it takes an object to its gluing diagram. So what does that look like? Well, it, it goes from Z mod to this right lax limit. Um, and I think you'll probably be able to see what the um, functor does. J uh, let me just describe the right adjoint in this case. Uh, so the right lax limit is basically this rational vector space and then a two complete uh, Z, Z hat two module and three and five. And then you have this unit map into, uh, this is a slight abusive notation. I'm already considering it as a subcategory of Z modules. Um, but really it's like this thing and you apply this functor and then you have a map to it. Um, but it's, it's equivalent data. So, uh, but I've got M2, whatever it is, it's just some two complete uh, Z hat two module, uh, two attic. Uh, module over the two addicts, uh, and so on. And we're taking the limit. This is the subdivision category of this post at P sub Z. And the limit, um, you can just kind of wrap it up as a single pullback. Here's a pullback, here's a pullback, here's a pullback. So just uh, put those all together. Limits can meet with limits. And we're getting the pullback of uh, this diagram right here. So I take the product of all of these terms, the product of all of these terms, and then I've got this term that maps compatibly to the product. Um, and now we encounter a problem. We wanted uh, X to be reconstructed as the right lax limit of, of its gluing diagram. That was what the previous cases suggested. Um, but as I said, it's only an adjunction. So here, the problem we can see in this example um, of Z modules, so suppose I have a Z module M. Well, let me just recall from the very beginning, the arithmetic fracture is telling us that it's this pullback right here. So the product of its P completions, its rationalization, and then the rationalization of the product of the P completions. Compare that with what appears right here. It's pretty similar. So this is the unit map of the adjunction. So I start with M, I go forwards, and I go back, and I end up with something like this. Um, and if I do that to this object M, I get, well, the difference is the, um, the product of the rationalizations, uh, the product of the P completions, the rationalization, those are the same, but then this term is different. Um, there's this interchange. Rather than rationalizing each individually, uh, well, here I rationalize each individually and then I take the product, whereas the correct thing, the thing that we want, uh, we wanted to recover arithmetic fracture, uh, is that we wanted to first take the product of the p-completions and then rationalize. Uh, so this is not generally an equivalence. An explicit example, it, it is an equivalence if M is finitely generated, um, but an explicit uh, example where it fails to be an equivalence is uh, Z mod two plus Z mod three plus Z mod five all the way out um, over all primes. Uh, you can see that the, the p-completion is just uh, Z mod p, uh, and then you take the product of all of those and you rationalize it's non-zero. 
But if you rationalize them each individually, those are all zero, and then you take the infinite product, and um, that's still zero. So this is not an equivalence, and it is a problem of convergence. So here's a theorem. Uh, let P be a poset. So first of all, this construction that takes a stratified category, so here's P stratified categories. I'll denote that by strat P. And I can take their gluing diagrams. So this is its macrocosm gluing diagram. Um, and that gives me a left lax uh, functor from P to cat and uh, maps between stratified categories end up giving me right lax uh, natural transformations. Uh, and so this is how that functor goes. And in fact, there's a functor back in the other direction, which basically, uh, if I have such a thing, you can think of this as a locally co-Cartesian vibration over my poset. You just take uh, right lax limits like in families, uh, and that ends up giving you a P-stratified category. So first of all, I have this metacosm adjunction. So that's just context for the thing we already saw, which is the macrocosm adjunction. If I have a stratified category, then, uh, well, it has this functor out to the right lax limit of its gluing diagram. And that functor is actually exactly the unit of this adjunction at X. So the unit at X of this adjunction is the macrocosm adjunction for X. And this takes an object to its microcosm gluing diagram. Uh, it takes a quasi current sheaf to all of its uh, geometric localizations and then the compatibility uh, data between them. And this is the unit map. Uh, it's actually a morphism in PRL, so it has a right adjoint for free, and that right adjoint is limit over the subdivision poset. Um, okay, so uh, let me just go a little bit further. Um, the unit uh, of this adjunction at an object is what I'll call a microcosm morphism. So this is a morphism from an object to the limit of its gluing diagram, and is a morphism in the category X. And uh, even further, this one might seem really silly, but it actually was a, well, it, it, it was essential for um, the equivariant cohomology computations uh, that I might describe later. Uh, well, obviously, for any object, uh, E, if you map into this morphism, well, you get a map from, uh, from E into F into, so this is a spectrum, spectrum of maps from E to F, you get a map into the limit of some other mapping spectra. But because these things are all kind of localized, you can likewise localize E. So the upshot, the upshot is that Han in the category X, you can think of these as like generalized elements of the sheaf F. It's literally elements uh, if E is the structure sheaf. So generalized elements are being reconstructed from local elements. These are Homs in the strata. So Homs over the whole scheme are being reconstructed as compatible Homs over the strata. So that's the nanocosm morphism. Um, and then here's, here's, so, so here's the real theorem, is that um, if the poset is down finite, which just it's a finiteness condition. It means every element, the stuff less than or equal to it is finite, notably not the poset PZ that we just saw. We had the generic point and then we had infinitely many primes living below it. Uh, that poset is not down finite. And, uh, but but, but uh, the theorem is if the poset is down finite, then the metacosm adjunction is an equivalent. Every uh, stratified category, if you take its gluing diagram and then you re-glue, well, you get an equivalent, you get the same stratified category. Um, of course, what, what I've just said is that that means that uh, this functor is also an equivalent. And in turn, well, that means that all of its unit maps are equivalences, which in turn means that whenever you hum into that, you also get an equivalent. So, so the implications are that uh, a down finite post set implies that this is an equivalent, implies that this is an equivalent, implies that this is an equivalent, implies that this is an equivalent. Um, and in fact, this, this one is reversible. Uh, the metacosm adjunction is an equivalent if and only if the post set is down finite. Likewise, um, 
the macrocosm adjunction is an equivalence if and only if every microcosm morphism is an equivalence, which by the Yoneda lemma is an equivalence if and only if for every E, the nanocosm morphism is equivalent. So there's uh, sort of a way to flow back, but you have to quantify over all of the things that we're looking at, say all test objects mapping in, or all objects, or all stratified category. Hey, Aaron. So that is the first theorem. Yeah. This is Clark. Um, yeah. I, Hi, uh, one of the things that uh, occurred to me just now is that the, the uh, in the case of your, of the, the, uh, the post set attached to Z, the mm -hmm. issue in a sense is kind of that, that it's not really just a post set. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's really a pro-finite post set, and somehow keeping that, that extra piece of information of that entire inverse limit. Uh, I, I love it. Address yeah. the, the mismatch here. Is that right? Can I even say the word pycnotic? Uh, yeah, I would love for that to be the case. That would be fantastic. Um, and it feels like exactly the right thing. Again, this was a convergence issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but perhaps we can continue talking about that in the. Like that. Maybe maybe next time we do a virtual MSRI. <laughs> MSR. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, no, I, I would love to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, so I also you were considering the not the specialization poset but the generalization poset, right? If I get my directions, correct. I think, or uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I chose a convention. I, I thought it was called the specialization post set, but if you find somewhere that oh, says the opposite, maybe. that's fine with me too. <laughs> I'm just wondering why, why is there this uh, interchange? And as Clark said, it's probably related to the failure to consider it as a pro finite post set rather than a uh, yes, well, that's certainly that's 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 a genuine mathematical uh, issue for sure. Yeah, and, and I, I do hope that these convergence issues are exactly repaired by keeping track of a topology uh, on, on that topological space rather than just the post set topology. Yeah. Um, so, well, we were just talking about that. The question remains: How do we recover? the arithmetic fracture square that we were just talking about. That really must be an example of this reconstruction, um, but it doesn't fall into this situation because the post that is not down finite. And that was actually an example of a stratification that did not converge. Uh, so the answer is a push forward of stratifications. Um, so there's in fact a whole, uh, a whole bunch of fundamental operations. Uh, let me just describe the two most interesting ones. So if I have a stratified category over P and I have a functor of posets from P to Q, I can take the push forward of this stratification and I get a push forward stratification. Uh, in fact, it's just a left con extension. And here's the example is uh, that PZ, all the primes go to zero and then the generic point goes to one. And when I take that push forward, I'm getting now a stratification over brackets one, AKA a recalmont of mod Z and it's this one. Um, I'm taking the product uh, of all of those strata and um, I've got the torsion, the complete, and then the Q modules over here. And taking this push forward uh, exactly implements, so, so look, brackets one is finite in particular, down finite. The stratification must converge by, by the theorem. Um, and this exactly recovers the arithmetic fracture square. Um, so that's one way of handling it. Uh, I agree, it's, it's less satisfying than keeping track of uh, the pose that's still. Um, let me just mention one other fundamental operation that I think is really nice. If X is stratified over P, and then additionally each stratum, I stratify it over some other pose that R sub P, there's a refined stratification uh, over what's called the Reese product pose set. You can probably guess what, uh, what pose set that is. Um, and then there are also a few other fundamental operations. And let me just mention that uh, they seem to hold exactly at the level of generality of a condition that uh, we called alignment. Um, it's really, really funny. I don't totally know what to make of it, but it feels like it's a sort of point set topology issue. It's sort of like a general position type of thing. It's like the point set topology of closed subcategories. Um, that's all I'll say about it. Please check out 
the paper if you're interested to learn more. Uh, so let me generalize this example. Uh, given a scheme, uh, I get a specialization post set. It's just the same underlying set. And then the relation, the order relation, is determined by specializations. This gives me an adelic stratification. Uh, so every point here, I can take its closure, and that's a closed subset. And then I can take quasi current sheep supported on that, and I get this composite is a stratification of QCO. And P sub X is generally not down finite, as we just saw in the case of X equals spec Z. Um, but I can take its push forward. If D is the dimension of X, I can take its push forward here. And then, uh, and then I get a stratification over this finite, and in particular down finite post set, which must converge. And this is an adelic reconstruction theorem that generalizes the uh, arithmetic factor square to any nice scheme. Um, all right, and here's a, an approximate description of, of the strata. Okay, so I'll now talk about O-monoidal stratifications. And uh, something that I find really satisfying is that this requires almost no uh, additional setup. Um, it's, it, it's all like for free. You know, we're doing infinity category theory, infinity two category theory even a little bit, uh, and yet, all we need to do is check some conditions about functors between post sets. That's great. Uh, okay, so O is a, a nice operad, um, just some very mild conditions, so we don't get too bogged down in the combinatorics. So for instance, the EN operad, uh, except for E0, uh, and then R is an O monoidal category. So if it's E1, that's monoidal, E2 is braided monoidal, E infinity is symmetric monoidal. So all of those cases, those are the best cases uh, that I know of, uh, are, are contained uh, as examples in what I'm about to say. Um, so here's a definition. Um, so first of all, a subcategory is called an ideal if it's contagious under the monoidal structure. So that just means uh, if you tensor, if you're symmetric monoidal, say you tensor two things together and one of them was in the ideal, then the output is in the ideal. Uh, for, for a general operad, you have to be a bit more careful and talk about uh, n area operations. If your operad is quadratic, meaning generated by two area operations, uh, then you just have to think, check things at level two. But it's, it's no more difficult to discuss the general case. Uh, so that's the Aaron, ideal. Yeah. Aaron, did you, did you invent that terminology before or after the COVID-19? Oh, I, I didn't even invent it, but I, I, I think Theo Johnson phrased uh, used it at some point and it, it, it stuck. Uh, I see, so me. it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> a little meta, yeah. Um, it's, it's evocative. Uh, I didn't intend it to, yeah, it hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so you have to be contagious, just, just like multiplication of elements in a ring. I mean, that's what an ideal is. Uh, notice that it's con contagious under the monoidal structure. So if I'm talking monoidal, then I mean like a two-sided ideal, but that's implicit in this definition. Uh, it's, it's a special case of that. And um, formally, uh, if I have an ideal subcategory, its inclusion is uh, automatically O-monoidal, uh, non-unitally, um, and that implies that its right adjoint is uh, laxly O-monoidal. Um, and so now I'll make the definition a closed ideal it's simultaneously a closed subcategory and an ideal. And then there's one compatibility condition, which is that this right adjoint is actually strictly homonoidal or strongly. Or what, I always forget which is which. Um, but so uh, I, I need to require that this is strictly homonoidal. Uh, and that's the condition to be a closed ideal. And that's it. Now I can define an homonoidal stratification. It's just a stratification that admits a factorization through the full subposet of the closed ideals as opposed to just closed subcategories. So uh, same story, I've got strata, uh, level P, mod, everything less than P. The stratum is once again an omenoidal category. I have this adjunction. Uh, the left adjoint is omenoidal, the right adjoint is laxly omenoidal, and the gluing di diagram admits an enhancement. 
so the gluing diagram is this left lax functor from the post set to categories. And it enhances to a functor to, so these are omenoidal categories and lax, uh, laxly omenoidal functors between them. That's how the gluing diagram uh, upgrades. And you, you could have guessed that that laxness would appear because uh, the, the, the transition functors uh, for this diagram involve the right adjoint and the left adjoint. So you compose those together. Laxly omenoidal composed with omenoidal gives, in general, laxly omenoidal. Uh, and with that, here's here's the reconstruction theorem in this situation, uh, which is question. Yeah, question. Yeah. Um, so I guess you're maybe thinking about schemes in this uh, definition of closed ideal. Um, if I take yeah. representations of a finite group and uh, well, whatever. I take representations of a finite group. Um, do you know what these closed what these closed ideals are supposed to be? Yeah, well, I'll give you a different description of closed ideals in just a moment, which uh, hopefully will um, be helpful. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, in just a moment uh, after I state this theorem. Um, so, so if I have an omenoidal stratification, um, first of all, so, so, so the main point, the, the main construction is I had this adjunction of categories and that adjunction lists to an adjunction um, in algo lax of cat. So uh, this is the same category it was, and then this is an enhancement. It's the limit of this listed diagram, the right lax limit of this listed uh, left lax diagram. And when you forget, uh, it, you just get the original re-glued category. And then this adjunction upgrades, so G upgrades to G tensor. Uh, the left adjoint again is omenoidal, and the right adjoint is laxly omenoidal. Um, in particular, the, the really, the, the main point is, in particular, um, if this is an equivalent, for instance, as guaranteed by the post that being down finite, uh, then this is also an equivalence. So the omenoidalness of the reconstruction comes for free uh, once the stratification itself was omenoidal. Uh, ah, so actually, here's an example. Um, is uh, so so one good example uh, from schemes is that closed subcategories, in fact, uh, sorry, closed subsets don't just give closed subcategories, but they give ideal closed ideal subcategories with respect to the symmetric monoidal structure. So I have this factorization. Absolutely any uh, ordinary stratification of the scheme uh, therefore gives a symmetric monoidal stratification of QCO, uh, and if uh, if this converges, then that converges, and we get a symmetric monoidal reconstruction theorem. For example, uh, the adelic stratification that I mentioned earlier is actually a symmetric monoidal stratification. Um, and here's a, a sort of a generalization of that, uh, which given everything else is, is quite easy. Uh, if I have a rigidly compactly generated, uh, that's just like a finiteness condition, uh, but symmetric monoidal category, that's the main point, there's this, uh, again, an adelic stratification over um, its Balmer spectrum, really the specialization post of its, of its Balmer spectrum. If you're familiar with that, that's great. Um, if not, I'll just say that's sort of a way, if I gave you just the symmetric monoidal category Q co of X, you could hope to reconstruct X, first of all, as a topological space, um, just from that data, and this is, the name of that construction. It's called uh, taking the Balmer spectrum. Um, okay, so then here's, uh, here's the thing I was just alluding to a moment ago is an alternative description of ideals. Uh, it's this. So closed ideals can be described in terms of item potence. Uh, and there's uh, the, the main point, and then there's a few easy corollaries, is that a, a closed ideal uh, corresponds to a certain object, uh, the inclusion of its own unit object, uh, the IL inclusion of its own unit object. And this is uh, what we define to be a central augmented item potent. So augmented just means you have a map to the unit. Item potent means that when you tensor it with itself and then you map to one tensor itself, that's an equivalence. Um, so that's what an augmented idempotent is. And again, you can 
be slightly more careful and then get something that works for any operad instead of just quadratic operads. So describe that here. Um, but I'll describe the main case of interest. Uh, let me just zoom in here. I'll describe the main case of interest uh, in just a moment. So first of all, it's not just an augmented idempotent, but in fact, it satisfies this additional condition of being central. Uh, so that's a condition about all lists of objects uh, as opposed to just the uh, idempotent itself. C stands here for like co-algebra. So, so what I want to say is, first of all, this centrality is automatic uh, for En as soon as N equals two. So if you're in a braided monoidal category, then the word central is vacuous. Every augmented idempotent is automatically central, and those are equivalent to closed ideals. And in the monoidal case, the E1 case, there's just one thing to check. Um, that operator is still quadratic. Um, and it's just this. For every object, so you can tensor on both sides with your augmented idempotent. You can map, you can get rid of one or you can get rid of the other. And both of those have to be equivalences. And now you can perhaps see why the, the word central is apt. Uh, because we're passing the C through the X, and this is for all objects X. So again, this is an alternative sort of like microcosm, internal way of describing these closed ideals. Okay. Um, so I guess, yeah, there's still plenty of time. So I will uh, say a few words about equivariant cohomology. Um, Sorry, this is so. Just, I'm still a little. Uh, oh yeah, sure. So, so why is there a one inside of your ideal? Because if, if the ideal had one, wouldn't it have? Oh, yes. Uh, so in rings theory, uh, that's exactly right. An ideal that contains the unit object um, is, uh, is is the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but when you're looking at ideal categories, it turns out that the ideal ends up being a, an, a monoidal category in its own right. However, the inclusion is not monoidal. So it's got its own like local unit, um, uh -huh. uh, unit like object. It's like so, modules so, or some algebra object in your category. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is what I was referring to. So yeah. up here I said that this inclusion, so I became O monoidal and the inclusion became non-unitally uh, but laxly so there's a map from the unit here you map it in and then there's a map to the unit of r and that's actually exactly this map this guy maps down to the unit of r. i should have you know what i'm going to say that right now this yeah. maps this equals uh i l y of the unit of, this is what i should have written There we go. So uh, yeah, this is like the localized, you take the unit and you localize into the ideal, you come back. Uh, and that, that was the unit for the ideal, but it's no longer the unit in the whole category. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, okay, so equivariant cohomology. Uh, so if I have a finite group and a G manifold, um, I think the, the best, the, well, the most fundamental justification that I know of uh, for this notion that I'll briefly discuss is, is Poincare duality. Um, so it's difficult for G manifolds. And just think about why Poincare, uh, Poincare duality has something to do with, say, the Tom space of the, the tangent bundle. And when you've got a G manifold, then uh, these the tangent spaces uh, sort of get patched together interestingly um, as the group acts. And if the group acts freely, then it's not so hard, but if the group acts with some fixed points, then um, you get a representation of some subgroup, the, what is it, isotropy subgroup on that tangent space. Um, and it, it's all much more complicated. And, and the upshot is that your theory needs to incorporate uh, not just stabilization with respect to spheres, as usual homotopy theory proceeds from spaces to spectra, but you have to stabilize with respect to representation spheres. So 
again, some subgroup acts on uh, a tangent space, and that tangent space has to become tensor invertible. Um, so, so, so the point is that uh, we need cohomology to be uh, graded uh, to, to be ROG graded. So here ROG stands for just the representation ring, finite dimensional uh, G representations of the real numbers. Um, and given such a virtual representation, for instance, just a representation, you get, um, you get a cohomology that is graded by, well, an integer I and also by that representation. So here implicitly by Cohomology, I'm meaning uh, cohomology with values in the constant Mackey function of Z. Uh, so, so first of all, there's that, the ROG grading. And then second of all, uh, for things to work out compatibly, you also have to remember this, not just as an abelian group uh, based on I and, and Z, but in fact, as a Mackey functor. Uh, so a Mackey functor valued in abelian groups. Um, so whatever that is, it's a whole, it's a whole lot systemic. Um, but it is um, more or less the minimal thing that you need for equivariant point gray duality. Um, but so it is a lot. And as a result, this equivariant uh, ROG graded cohomology is hard to compute, even in the case where the manifold is a point. Um, so there are some computations out there. I think most famously uh, is a computation for uh, the cyclic group of order four and of order eight. Uh, by Hill Hopkins Ravenel uh, in their uh, proof of the curve invariant one problem. Um, but that's just one example. There are some other complications out there as well. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, a pretty difficult computation and it's known for those groups more or less. Um, so usually how this proceeds is effectively people do homological algebra in the category of Mackey functors. Homological algebra in the category of Mackey functors. Uh, and the key insight here, and this is, this is not due to us, um, but we push it forward. The key insight is that there's a slightly better category to consider. Um, so first of all, so this equivariant cohomology, that's a functor from uh, spaces, G spaces, really uh, genuine G spaces uh, to Mackey functors uh, valued in abelian groups. That's the functor. And um, first of all, this factors through genuine G spectra. You can take the genuine G suspension spectrum and you get, um, and you can define cohomology there. But the observation is that we can do a step better than that. Um, likewise, with ordinary cohomology, you can compute it in chain complexes. And so, uh, the, the point is that you can do the same thing uh, in the equivariant context. So you can take genuine G objects in Z modules. Uh, this is, for one, it's the tensor product of genuine G spectra with Z modules, but also it's just Mackey functors uh, for G valued in um, this symmetric monoidal infinity category, mod Z. Um, so this we call genuine GZ modules. They've also, uh, I think they're introduced by Kaladin. Uh, they're called derived Mackey functors by him. Uh, and this uh, we assert is the correct version uh, of chain complexes in the equivariant context. Um, so this is, well, mod Z, that's the derived infinity category of abelian groups. And what that is not, uh, that is not the derived category of Mackey functors of abelian groups you see uh, the D and the Mac do not commute. Um, so this is basically what you're working in when you do homological algebra in Mackey functors in abelian groups, and this is uh, a better place to work. Uh, so first of all, there's a, a general theorem, and as you can imagine, it's a, a reconstruction theorem for these genuine GZ modules. Um, and we just work in, in the context of the group CP to the N. So in fact, Kaladin has a version of this theorem as well, uh, and it uses uh, the tape vanishing results of Nikolaus Schulze. Uh, there's a lot of really great simplifications that happen when you work Z linearly. Um, so here's the theorem. It's that uh, genuine CP to the N Z modules 
uh, are recorded uh, in a symmetric monoidal fashion uh, as uh, it, it's just equivalent to the limit of this diagram. So let me unpack this. It's a, a homotopy CTZN module. And then you take its CP Tate construction, uh, whatever that is, it's a classical uh, tractable thing to do. You take its CP Tate construction, and then simultaneously I have to name an arrow in homotopy CP N minus one V modules. And this, uh, the value here has to equal the target. And then I take Tate of the source and the value there has to equal the target and so on and so forth all the way down. So you see I'm losing uh, equivariance each time until I get all the way down to CP to the zero. And lastly, I name an arrow in C modules uh, and that the target has to be some priorly specified thing. Um, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, if you're familiar with equivariant homotopy theory, I'll say this is, um, again, as I suggested earlier, this is recording the uh, geometric fixed points, which operation is actually compatible with passing from uh, genuine G spectra to genuine G Z modules. It inherits a notion of uh, categorical fixed points and geometric fixed points. Um, and I'm just remembering this genuine G object in terms of its geometric fixed points and gluing data. And uh, it ought to be, and indeed for spectra, it is uh, a whole bunch more. There's like uh, these higher squares, higher cubes, and so on. Um, but uh, these vanishing results really uh, drastically simplify things. Uh, so this ends up giving what's called a strict stratification, which is actually even more than being convergent. The strat the, the 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 functor from the poset to cat is a, a an actually strict functor rather than the less lax functor. Um, and even more than that, actually, the the composites in that diagram are zero. So it's like um, as good as could be without being trivial. Um, so that's the that's the abstract theorem, and let me just uh, outline what the resulting computations will look like. Uh, you can see the paper draft uh, for more details. Um, so let's just take P to be now an odd prime. Uh, it slightly simplifies things. Uh, and this is it. So first of all, we can compute uh, the entire Picard group of this category. Um, and it's this, it's this, it's that abelian group. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of copies of Z. And then there's these various uh, rings. And then you take their multiplicative elements. And then you quotient by uh, the subgroup of plus and minus 1. And you do that for all different Rs. And I'll just say uh, that these are coming up. Uh, they arise in the homotopy uh, of the Tate construction uh, on uh, homotopy fixed points of Z is basically where that's coming from. So that is the Picard group. Um, which the relevance of which I'll, I'll explain in just a moment. So the Picard group is is this explicit group. I'll call that G for short. The second corollary is that this composite homomorphism. So now we're getting back to R O G stuff. Uh, so R O C P to the N. The uh, the manner in which R O G graded uh, cohomology factors through um, genuine GZ module is uh, in particular that uh, this virtual representation goes to a virtual representation sphere in spectra, but you can also Z linearize that. So kind of the point of genuine G spectra is that these all become invertible. Oops, this should say pick right here. Um, the point is that these all become invertible. And then when you tense with V, that's a symmetric monoidal functor, so it preserves invertibility. And look, just a moment ago, I identified this Picard group as this thing G. It's this big uh, direct sum, but finite. Um, and we can completely describe in these terms of like these vectors, uh, the composite homomorphism from ROCPTN uh, to this Picard group. And it looks like this. Well. It's totally specified, CPVN is, is semi simple over R, so it's totally specified by its action on irreducible uh, representations. It, this is uh, freely generated as an abelian group by them. And it's this. Well, the trivial representation goes to this vector, and uh, a two dimensional irrep goes to that vector. Uh, let me mention that it uh, only depends on the kernel 
of the representation. There are different representations that are non-isomorphic that uh, have the same kernel, and it turns out that they give the same Picard element uh, when you z-linearize, um, but actually not when you only s-linearize. Um, and okay, so so this now I'm I've got the Picard group, and I'm relating back to ROG. And so in fact, we do better. We do better than computing the ROG graded cohomology. We compute the Picard graded cohomology. Um, so I, I won't give it here, but it's in terms of a bunch of homotopy fixed points and Tate construction and connective cover and some explicit, literally uh, chain level maps. Uh, we give a description of the Picard graded and uh, just by precomposition with this homomorphism, the ROG graded uh, equivariant cohomology of a point for uh, CP to the N for any N greater than or equal to zero. Okay, uh, wow, that timing was worked out pretty well. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, Aaron. Are there questions out there? I think I heard someone. Uh, Aaron, what's the the image of that that map from ROG to pick? I mean, it, it's it's evident from uh, yeah. your formulas. Well, one thing to mention, is, so so this is direct sum of abelian groups. Uh, one thing to mention is that we land entirely uh, just in uh, in this component. Um, I, you know, all of these coordinates are just one, which are the unit uh, the identity elements of, of these abelian groups. Um, so that, in particular, it is actually substantially different to compute PIC graded instead of ROG graded. Um, but the, the computation ends up being not really much harder. Uh, hey, hello? hey, Aaron. Hi, yeah. This is, this is Chris. Um, do you have a sense of how how much information the tensor Z is destroying from the spectral pick to the mod Z pick? Um, yeah, so actually this Picard group was computed uh, quite a while ago. Uh, Faust, Lewis, and May uh, computed it for any compact Lie group. Uh, our methods only apply to finite groups. Um, it's actually, uh, well, it's pretty far from surjective. Um, and uh, uh, it, it turns out, um, it, this is explained in a remark in the, uh, in the intro to the paper, you can see, but basically it has to do with how very different the Tate construction is. Tate CP of the sphere is the P complete sphere, in particular it's connective. Um, Tate Z is uh, two periodic. Um, mm. And basically Picard elements are being parameterized by, among other things, uh, unit homogeneous uh, homogeneous unit elements in the homotopy ring of pick, uh, 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 sorry, of Tate. Uh, and so for Z, you've got these homogeneous el uh, invertible elements in every even degree. But for the sphere, look, that's, that's connective. So you can't even go outside of dimension zero, even though you've got all the homotopy groups of spheres be completed in all positive dimensions. Um, so it's okay. actually very far from surjective. Um, I haven't looked closely, but I think um, it's not terribly far from being injective. Cool, thanks. It might even be injective. So I had a question about maybe something um, uh, not so serious, but um, in the E1 case, you say you still have this kind of Balmer spectrum, which I'm guessing is classifying uh, uh, two-sided primes or something like that in your uh, in your category, um, but I, uh, I I've not seen that. So, are you getting a locally ring space for the spectrum in that case? Ah, so I yeah I should have clarified. We don't define a so so this is in the symmetric monoidal case that we oh, connected I'm with. I'm sorry. The yeah. Balmer spectrum, but it has been studied. There is a paper out there. Um, God, I think it even acknowledges you. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, there is a paper out there that um, that studies uh, Balmer spectra of uh, monoidal uh, yeah. categories, 
And they have a few different notions of ideals. Uh, it's not just about the two-sidedness, but I think also the ideal condition is maybe slightly, or maybe it's actually the prime, what, what it means to be a prime ideal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so. But as I mentioned, the abstract, the, the, the point to me is that you can study these categories in terms of their Balmer spectra, but then you can also take like push forward or refinement and um, study them in other ways. You know, just computing Balmer spectra is often very difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, so do you have some problem with working outside of the symmetric case, like if I was E3 or E4 or whatever? No problem. I um, Like just having the this same was, theorem? Ah, um, no, no, I don't think there should be any problem. Uh, it, it's only the, the fact that uh, symmetric monoidal categories are what are mainly studied in, in the Balmer context. I would say this gives, I would say this is very, this, this theory is very suggestive of what one uh, ought to do in the EN case. Uh, okay, yeah. Sorry. And in the E1 case, it relates to two sided ideal. Uh -huh. But as soon as you're at E2, uh, it turns out there's it's really fine. not much. It's just, it's just these augmented item components. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah, again, that's a bit in the weeds. So thanks for answering. Yeah, no problem. You're welcome. Hey, Aaron, there's a question by you, Fang. Oh. Sure. Like stratification over Balmer spectra. How is it related with rigidity of R? Ooh. Um, so there's this interesting issue that um, the, 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 you can always define um, a functor uh, from the specialization post set of the Balmer spectrum to closed ideals. Um, but actually, uh, that functor may not satisfy the generation condition. Um, and uh, I, this theorem was not quite precisely uh, stated. There's an additional assumption, and it, it may fail. Uh, there's an example that we give in the paper uh, that uh, where the generation condition fails. but Rigidity, uh, rigidly compactly generated is also a finiteness condition. Um, and it's present in much of the Balmer spectrum tensor triangulated literature. Uh, so it was just what we went with uh, in order to have a theorem there. Um, but I would not be surprised if the theorem fails uh, when you throw that away. I mean, it, well, oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have said, if I have a large um, sym symmetric monoidal presentable uh, stable infinity category, um, rigidly compactly generated is saying that when I pass to, to compact objects, uh, it, it's promising that I, I get still a symmetric monoidal structure. Uh, so it's some compatibility with size and tensor uh, between size, the size of objects and their tensor products. Um, so actually, if you threw that away, maybe the Balmer spectrum of, see there's an R omega in here that may not even be well defined anymore. So uh, would it still make sense to take the Balmer spectrum of the dualizable objects? I don't know. Um, I know that, I, I feel like I, I recall seeing a paper that attempted to find Balmer spectra uh, just using large categories um, rather, than, uh, rather than passing to subcategories of compact objects. Um, so perhaps that would give something regarding dualizables, but I, I certainly don't know. Um, I mean, why not? I think you're, you're allowed as long as you have a small uh, symmetric monoidal stable uh, infinity category. So uh, I have another question. I was going to ask about the uh, situation of O monoidal stratifications where you can work uh, unstably. Because as you know, for instance, you can reconstruct the, um, I mean, the notion of recallment upgrades to say an omenoidal recallment in a sort of obvious way, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's but, a special case of an omenoidal stratification. But, but that, uh, I think when you were describing the theory of omenoidal stratifications, you were working uh, stably throughout. Is that correct or? In fact, the, the whole talk has been, yeah, stable. But, but the notion um, of symmetric monoidal recallment can be done, for instance, in the just the situation of 
um, it's true. Yeah. The limits and where the, the gluing functor is, say, a, a laxly symmetrical neural left exact functor, for instance. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, if, if, if I'm guessing correctly what you're going to ask, I don't see any obstruction to uh, proving a reconstruction theorem in that case. Okay, sure. I was just sort of asking, asking about the very definition, maybe. Uh, yeah, so, so something that, so uh, I should have said, um, I'm glad we're still being recorded so I can. This was all heavily inspired by Saul Glassman's theory of stratified categories. Uh, it is a serious simplification. Um, Saul uh, records a whole diagram indexed over the subdivision um, of the post set. And one of our observations was to use presentability to just record the closed subcategories. And then you can take quotients and stuff for free. Um, but if you're working in, if, if you're not remembering that your categories are presentable, then you're having to keep track of all of the sub quotients and so on, like diagrammatically. And I think that might be necessary uh, to do so in, in the unstable context to keep track of sub quotients. But I, I think there is uh, a story that is perhaps more closely aligned with uh, Saul's uh, than, than with what's written here. The, yeah. the, the combination of presentability and stability uh, really makes things a lot cleaner. I'll just uh, pick up on that, Aaron. And you made a comment about Please. this, uh, but it, it, yeah. we're all looking at it right now is in the definition of an omonodal stratification uh, to just appreciate that um, we're looking at just Uh, we lost David. It accommodates all kinds of uh, infinity category theory for us. Uh, I think you briefly cut out there. Uh, I didn't get your full comment. Oh, I'll try one more time. If it cuts out, let's not worry about it. Is uh, the definition of O monodal stratification that we're looking at still only makes reference to ordinary posets? Yes. Um, and somehow. Yeah. Infinity category theory is packaged into the notion of closed ideal or, or closed subcategory, which is uh, uh, something that makes sense in the presentable situation. Thanks, David. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there's one more question by Yu Feng. Uh, does there exist any kind of chromatic filtration? Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that is an instance. Um, of this adelic stratification over the Balmer spectrum. Uh, it's over the specialization post set that uh, if you're asking that question, I, I hope you know and love. It's basically the natural numbers cross uh, cross spec Z, something like that, with you know, infinity and so on. That post set is not down finite. The stratification does not converge, um, but you can play with it in various ways. And that is worked out in uh, a lot of detail in an example. Uh, in the paper. If you just search for the word chromatic, you'll, you'll find it easily. Um, it's, uh, it can be slightly uh, tricky to figure out like which category is supposed to be closed, which one is the complement and so on. It's like the acyclics for like Morava EN minus one is the closed subcategory, it's something like that. Um, but yeah, this simultaneously packages together, uh, you know, by, by restriction of stratifications, by quotient stratifications, et cetera, uh, you can recover all of the other chromatic fracture cubes uh, and also uh, assembled over various primes all at a time, for example. I mean, I don't think this is like a computational win, but I think conceptually it does uh, reorganize a lot uh, from chromatic homotopy theory pretty cleanly. You were right. referring to Omar and Toby, right? Um, so, yeah, sorry? You were referring to the paper of Omar and Toby or some other paper? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Omar and Toby, uh, among others, but also uh, John Greenleaf and Scott Valchin, uh, and I think there are maybe even a few others. But yeah, this idea has been picked up a couple times in, in chromatic homotopy theory. Uh, also, I'll mention there's a, there's a stratification um, that does not quite converge either uh, that encapsulates good really calculus, and the convergent completion is the uh, analytic functors. Uh, so that's an example that Saul first discovered as well. Um, and it also very naturally fits into this picture. The post that's not down finite, the whole category is interesting and the convergent completion is also interesting.
So I, I think that's a, a feature of the theory rather than a bug. Are there any other questions out there? Okay, well, I invite um, each and every one of us to join right now. And let's thank Aaron again for that great talk. <laughs>